Today, we're going to be talking about how a normal commensal organism, the fungus Candida albicans, in some cases can become a virulent pathogen, as it did in the case of this seven-year-old boy named Alex. At birth, Alex had been premature, born 12 weeks before his due date, and weighing less than three pounds. While in the neonatal intensive care unit, he developed necrotizing enterocolitis, a life-threatening condition in which the immaturity of his intestinal walls and immune defenses allowed bacteria to spread from the lumen of his intestine into the walls, causing parts of those walls to die. A large portion of Alex's small intestine had to be surgically removed in order to save his life. Fortunately, baby Alex recovered well, and his parents were excited to finally take him home from the neonatal ICU when he was four months old. But because Alex didn't have enough small intestine left to effectively absorb nutrients, his parents had to learn to administer total parenteral nutrition. He received his nutrition through an IV, and this required him to always have IV access through a permanent central line inserted into his subclavian vein. At first, administering the TPN at home was overwhelming for Alex's parents, but soon it became a normal part of their routine. By the time he started school, Alex's TPN schedule was adjusted so he received all of the IV infusions at night while he slept, leaving him free of tubes during the day. At age seven, Alex was an energetic, happy first grader who loved learning about science and playing baseball with his friends at recess. One morning at school, Alex told his teacher that he felt tired and cold and when he was sent to the nurse, she found that his temperature was 39 degrees Celsius. Because she knew Alex was at high risk of central line infection, she called his parents right away so they could take him to the pediatrician. Alex's mother took him to the clinic at the hospital where his pediatrician removed the dressing from around his central line and examined the site. Even though she saw no redness, swelling, or discharge, she knew that the absence of external signs didn't rule out the line as a source of infection. So she took two blood samples, one from his central line and one from a vein in his arm. The samples were sent to the microbiology lab where they were incubated in culture and continually monitored for growth of organisms so that the infection could be identified as quickly as possible. Within 24 hours, both sets of cultures grew a yeast-like organism, and two days later, the yeast was identified as Candida albicans. Candida albicans is a normal commensal organism that colonizes human mucosal surfaces. More than 25% of us are colonized with Candida at any given time. This yeast species is actually thought to be beneficial in most people, playing an active role in the microbiome to shape normal immune recognition and tolerance. But in patients like Alex, breaks in the skin or mucosal barriers that usually protect the host can allow entry of candida into the bloodstream, especially on flat prosthetic surfaces like that of an intravenous catheter, the candida can then form part of a biofilm by multiplying within a matrix of material derived both from the fungus and potentially also from host cells. Within this complex of cells and extracellular matrix, candida exists as both filamentous or hyphal forms as well as round yeast-like cells. Each morphological type plays specific roles in various aspects of the infectious process, including the formation and maintenance of biofilm, penetration of tissues, and dissemination through the bloodstream. When candida infections spread from the initial site to other organs, this most commonly involves the liver, kidneys, skin and soft tissues, heart valves, and retinas. Candidemia most often occurs in patients who have either an indwelling catheter like Alex or patients who have disruptions of their gastrointestinal wall, such as a bowel perforation. This type of infection also arises at much greater frequency in immunosuppressed patients. Alex was admitted to the hospital where he underwent a detailed physical exam to look for any signs that the candida infection had spread to other organs. 
Unfortunately, he had no skin lesions or muscle abscesses to indicate infiltration of his soft tissues and no heart murmur to suggest infection of the heart valves. A dilated eye exam was also normal, suggesting that the yeast had not spread to his retinas. Alex's central line was removed and a mucus-like film was seen at the catheter tip. The observation of this fungal-derived biofilm on the catheter confirmed to Alex's physicians that they would not have been able to likely treat this infection had the catheter been left in place. This complex mixture of cells and extracellular matrix material, seen here in a scanning electron micrograph, is very difficult for drugs to penetrate, providing a protected niche for the microorganism, even in the face of antifungal drug therapy. Although candidemia has a very high overall mortality rate of 30 to 40 percent, Alex's doctors were optimistic that he would recover because he had several factors working in his favor. His central line had been quickly identified as the source of the infection and removed. The fungus hadn't notably spread to his organs and his immune system was normal. Based on the results of antifungal susceptibility testing that had been performed in the lab, Alex was started on an IV antifungal medication and his fever rapidly resolved. Several days later, once his blood cultures had remained negative for 72 hours, a new central line was placed so he could restart his TPN. The next week, Alex was able to return home and he went back to school in time to finish the first grade with his classmates.